Hi, I'm Micah Halper, and thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Americans. Americans do not care about much of anything, so it should not be a surprise to you that they have lost interest or have no interest in Israel and Gaza. Most Americans don't care about Israel, the Palestinians, the Middle East. They don't care. They couldn't find Gaza on a globe, even a marked globe. And that's not an exaggeration. It should not come as a surprise. Americans suffer from malaise. They are consumed by malaise. Actually, most Americans don't really care about anything that doesn't directly involve them. So not caring about Israel and the Middle East is simply par for the course. Now, malaise is not a modern American malady. As far back as July 15, 1979, then President Jimmy Carter, via television, delivered his now famous malaise speech. He spoke of a moral and economic crisis, a crisis spreading across the United States, a crisis of confidence, of economics, and of spirit. Today's malaise is worse. By the way, you should note that he never used the word malaise in his speech, but that's a different story. Americans simply do not care. Judging by the media coverage of late, one might think that the support for Israel is eroding quickly. That truth is that interest is eroding only with the few who cared enough to pay attention to world events in the first place. When watching the media, we don't take into account the masses who, from the start, never cared. The masses who simply are disinterested, not only in the Israel issue, but in every other issue as well. Americans suffer from a lack of interest. They suffer from a general sense of inui. Sure, some get excited about sports or music, others about new movies, new books, new restaurants. But even that is waning. The lottery, let's say, recently hit over a billion dollars, and yes, over a billion. And for many, it was same old, same old. Large lottery pots used to pull in large numbers of people standing in long lines, dreaming of their soon-to-be-found fortunes while purchasing their $2 tickets. Today, the excitement is gone. The lines are almost disappearing. The itch to win a billion dollars, or even the sliver of a billion dollars, is gone. And a new term has been coined. They call it lotto boredom. Imagine that. Think about the war between Russia and Ukraine. Once front and center, it is now back burner issue. It is as back a burner as it can get in the minds of the average American. Stop people on the street and you will learn that an outstand, out, astounding number of people don't even realize that war is still being waged between Russia and Ukraine. Many people, especially young people, get their news from the comedy shows, the late shows, once upon a time, the late shows, the comedy shows, were hosted by Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, David Letterman, John Stewart, were watched live. Today, they're most often watched at the convenience of the watcher, the viewer, on YouTube or X. The immediacy is gone. They're clips, snippets, not the whole thing. The ability to skip segments that are not relevant to their lives and fast forward are skipped also. New information never reaches their consciousness. There are, of course, supporters of Israel. There are those who care, who read every report that comes out, who watch every news program that comes across. Those who seek out websites and briefings, who search for coverage that does not vilify Israel, they are the people who are involved. Trying to push back against the lies and the disinformation as being liberally spread. But they are in the minority, and then there are the many who are spreading the lies. Those who are being spread, those lies are being spread by Israel's detractors. They are the second group of people who care, who really intensely, vocally, and in a very misguided way care. These distractor, detractors are deeply emotionally committed to portraying Israel and Jews in the most vile and evil light. Truth and facts are not germane. They post posters, proclaiming rape is resistance, and babies are occupiers. They are driven by a nearly medieval sense of Jew hatred, far deeper and more visceral 
the modern anti-Semitism. But most Americans are in the middle. They don't care much about anything. They not only don't care where Gaza is, they don't know what Hamas stands for, what Hamas holds holy. If you told them, they would probably listen, just like they would listen to the detractors. And their takeaway would be that the kafia makes a very attractive scarf. When people stop caring, they stop caring about everything. Right and wrong, evil and justice becomes just words. Issues-based dialogue and decisions become less relevant, often even totally irrelevant. Converting an Israel detractor from a hater of Jews and Israel into a lover or even a defender of Jews and Israel is nearly impossible. That should not be the goal, the objective. The challenge is not how to transform detractors into supporters, but how to get the masses of Americans who couldn't care less to care about something. In our world, that something is Israel. Buried deep inside, Americans know that hating Jews, burning and murdering and massacring Jews, and then embracing their murderers is wrong. The challenge is to get them to care. It's worth the effort. But if it doesn't work, there is no reason to despair. With or without apathetic Americans, Israel will not just survive, it will gloriously support and be enormously creative. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from Ynet. It was written by Ariel Oserin and published on March 3rd, 2024. The column is entitled, Russia Raises Stakes with Moves Along Israel's Borders. Subtitle, Analysis, While Relations Have Experienced Strain Since October 7th, They Have Not Reached a Breaking Point, Leaving Room for Potential Diplomatic Maneuvering in the Near Future. It's a long title and subtitle, but it does convey the ideas. Osterman lays out a very important issue. He posits that Russia is making a significant play for greater involvement in the Middle East. He proves this point with excellent examples of Russia's movement. It all translates into greater Russian influence. This is how he begins. As Russian warships from the Pacific Fleet entered the Red Sea amid heightened tensions, and with Russian forces establishing new observation posts along the Israel-Syrian border, questions arise about Russia's intentions in the Middle East. The Russian Ministry of Defense announced that a missile cruiser and a frigate have crossed the Bab el-Maneb Strait and reached the Red Sea amid ongoing Houthi attacks, though the purpose of their mission remains unclear. This move follows the Kremlin's denial of receiving security assurances from the Houthis to prevent attacks on their ships, raising concerns about Russia's strategic goals. Simultaneously, Russian forces continue to expand their presence in the Syrian Golan Heights, with plans to inaugurate an 11th observation post soon. Now Osirin asks the questions, the big questions. Why is Russia doing this? And he writes, the recent surge in Russian involvement in the region, particularly concerning Israel, since October 7th prompts two main interpretations. Firstly, Russia appears to be asserting itself in the Red Sea, aligning its actions with its rhetoric by deploying ships to the Red Sea amidst escalating tensions. Russia is signaling its willingness to engage in the volatile maritime arena, potentially altering the dynamics of the region significantly. Moreover, Russia increased presence along the Israel-Syrian border could serve to bolster its position in the event of a broader conflict positioning itself as a key player in regional affairs. The second interpretation suggests that Moscow is sending a clear message to Jerusalem. Recent tensions between the two nations, particularly regarding Russia's support for Hamas, and Israel's statements in support of Ukraine may have prompted Russia to increase its military presence along Israel's borders as a form of diplomatic pressure. Osterman concludes this way. These developments underscore the need for the Israeli government to reassess its strategic relationship with Russia. While relations have experienced strain since October 7th, 
they have not reached the breaking point, leaving room for potential diplomatic maneuvers in the near future. This is a very important set of observations and analysis by Osirin. Russia is a force to contend with, and knowing what they are doing and their goals, what they want to accomplish, is very important in preserving stability in the Middle East. Next up is a column by Ben Dror Yamini. It's entitled, The Myth of Jewish Influence, subtitled, Opinion, Notion of Jewish Influence Dissipates Upon Examining the U.S. Policy, Donations to American Universities, and Jewish Academics Vehemently Opposing Israel. It was published on March 23, 2024, in Ynet also. Ben Dror suggests that there is a myth of Jewish involvement and influence and control in America. He argues the post-October 7th, it is clear that Jews have much less influence than the myth proposed. This is how Ben Dror Yamini begins. We are in the midst of a crisis with Americans. The pro-Israel lobby was supposed to come to Israel's defense, despite Jews' excessive representation in politics, culture, academia, and media. Thus, Anti-Semitic discourse represents Jews as a threatening and dangerous force, a monster with countless tentacles controlling the world. Stephen Walt and John, uh, John Mearsheimer published the book, The Israel Lobby and the U.S. Foreign Policy. According to them, APAC and the American Israel Public Affairs Committee dictates U.S. policy in the Middle East, and the special relationship with Israel led to September 11th terror attack and Islamic terror against the West in general. Although the two insisted they are not anti-Semitic, those who were used this book as an academic source to buttress their ideology. It's doubtful whether we needed October 7th to know that the supposed Jewish clout is a myth. Not only is it not real, but Jews are increasingly becoming a scapegoat. While there is no chance there will be an academic course in the U.S. on Islamophobia, there is a prestigious course that teaches a course connecting the occupation to genocide. And quite a few universities associate Zionism, a movement of self-definition in the historical land of Israel, as colonialism. As the column continues, Ben Dror Yamini attacks the arguments. He is so correct in asserting that these arguments are not just false, but filled with Jew hatred. He continues, how is it that colonialism, where my grandparents, who came to Israel over a hundred years ago due to persecution and oppression against Jews, colonizers? Were the Jews who fled pogroms in Russia and Poland colonizers? Are the rest of the Jewish refugees colonizers? Tens of millions of people were displaced in the past century, and only the Palestinians received the honor of a historic event defined as one of the most serious crimes in modern history? This is one of the gravest lies in academia, which completely ignores Jewish displacement. Overall, more Jews were expelled from Arab countries than Palestinians from Israel. Do the Jews control academia? Now, ben Dror Yamini looks at Jewish influence in universities. He concludes once again that it is no more than a myth. The column continues. Recently, Franklin Foyer wrote in The Atlantic, the golden age of American Jews is ending. There has never been a debate about the anti-Semitism from the right, Foyer writes, but there has been indifference to the growth of anti-Semitism from the left. In fact, there was Jewish influence, but from the anti-Zionist direction. Jewish academics, from Noam Chomsky to Judith Butler, to Sarah Roy to Ian Lustig, to Norman Finkelstein, are at the forefront of the anti-Israel campaign. They are not engaged in criticism. They provide legitimization for the demonization of Israel. Ben Dror also looks at donations to universities. And again, he concludes that it is merely a myth. Jews do not control that. He writes, Jewish influence being a myth does not mean there is not an idea ideally positioned machine pouring large sums of money into everything from culture and sports to media, academia, and government. 
According to a study by Mitchell Bard, Arab countries, get that, Arab countries have poured approximately $8.5 billion into academic institutions between 1986 and 2020, with Qatar leading with $4.34 billion alone. Even the Palestinian Authority is on the uptake with $7.46 million. Qatar's investments span the globe. It invested between $500 billion and a trillion dollars across several countries to acquire influence. Much of it goes to academia in the United States. The most foolish claim is that there is no connection between donations and academic output. This proves not only that there is a connection, but that it borders on criminal. It will prove difficult to sever the connection between the deep-rooted anti-Israel hostility and the influence of Hamas's patron. Ben Yamini concludes on an optimistic note, writing, there is no room for despair. The U.S., despite the differences and the current crisis, was and remains Israel's ally, but not because of the Jewish lobby. The key to our relationship remains our shared values, not only interests. We must not give them up. Well done, Ben Yumini, as always, an excellent, excellent column. Thank you so very much. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to show you six cartoons today. No memes, no headlines, just cartoons today. It's more and more difficult to find positive cartoons about Israel. Be warned, all of these cartoons are very critical of Israel and one of the United States, but they are especially critical of Bibi Netanyahu. This is a sampling of what people are seeing and what many people are thinking. The first cartoon depicts the starvation in Gaza. Gaza is depicted as an empty food bowl an emaciated man stares up at the sky, but instead of food rations being dropped, there is a shadow of a missile, of a rocket. This next cartoon is entitled, U.S. Double Message. We see Bibi Netanyahu reading a newspaper about Biden's critique of Israel, and he says, won't accept this. Then we see Bibi holding an annual aid check to Israel, and he says, will accept this. Next up is Bibi shooting himself in the foot with a gun, which has the word World Central Kitchen written on it. The caption reads, these things happen in war. This is a very biting criticism of Israel, very biting. This next cartoon is even worse. A soldier points to a grease board on which is written 33,000 dead, Hamas not dismantled, hostages not freed. Standing next to him is Bibi giving a thumbs up and he says, success, and is thinking, boy, how could anyone think that this is a success at all? This cartoon takes place in Gaza. We see rockets scattered everywhere. They are all made in the United States, and clearly they have caused massive destruction. A man holding a dismembered teddy bear looks up and sees a food package being dropped. It has the U.S. flag on it, and it reads, customer support. This final cartoon, like the one we just looked at, is not anti-Israel, but it's anti-US. We see the Gaza ceasefire talks and negotiating table. It has been totally destroyed by rockets and tanks and fighter jets. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. According to Yemen's Houthi rebel leader, Abdul Malik Bardin al-Houthi, 10 operations were carried out recently, using 37 missiles and drones, targeting nine ships with a total of 86 ships linked to Israel, the United States, and the United Kingdom being attacked. According to him, an attack was carried out against a lot, targeting assets belonging to the Israeli enemy. That's a quote. The Russian Navy Pacific Fleet is claiming that several Russian warships have passed the Bab el Manab Strait into the Red Sea amid attacks by Yemen's Houthi on merchant shipping. The Zezeda television station, owned by the Russian Defense Ministry, quoted the fleet as saying that Russian cruiser Yaryag and the frigate Marshal Shabanovskov were taking part in the voyage crossing into the Red Sea. France will provide over 30 million euros to UMRA 
the Palestinian Refugee Agency, to support its operations amid devastating war in Gaza. The French foreign minister did not say when the payment to the agency would be made. According to the usual quarterly schedule, the next payment is supposed to arrive sometime this month in April. Kuwait has already made its annual $2 million contribution to UMRA. That announcement was made by the Kuwaiti state news agency, Kuna. They said that UMRA has since announced that it has sufficient funds to run its operations until the end of May despite the many donors have halted their funding over Israeli accusations that some staff participated in Hamas's October 7th attack. Israeli President Isaac Herzog met with a delegation of U.S. lawmakers from the Democratic Party led by AIPAC. Speaking to the group, Herzog said, I want to express my gratitude to all of you for coming to Israel in these dire days and difficult moments. It means a lot to the Israeli people, and I am grateful to you. The United States of America has no greater friend than Israel, and Israel has no greater friend than the United States of America. This unbreakable bond, this alliance, is as strong as ever and is irreplaceable. That's a quote from Isaac Herzog, the President of Israel. Herzog also called the United States President Joe Biden, quote, a great friend of Israel, unquote. He said, quote, we share the objective of eradicating terror, of fighting the empire of evil, which emanates from Tehran and wants to undermine world law and order. And it's adverse directly to the national interest of the United States of America. And of course, as a clear enemy of ours, too. Meanwhile, Belgian Foreign Minister Hajda Labib said that her country would consider recognizing Palestine as a sovereign state. Her caveat was, when the moment comes, unquote. Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz spoke with the foreign ministers of Australia, Poland, and Great Britain and expressed his condolences for the death of their citizens in the incident which seven aid workers from World's Central kitchen were killed in the central Gaza Strip in an IDF attack. Katz promised that a thorough investigation will be done to prevent the recurrence of similar cases. Katz also noted the importance of the humanitarian aid provided by WCK and made it clear that Israel attaches importance to maintaining the safety of all workers of the humanitarian organizations in Gaza. Senior political officials say that the case of the deaths of WCK workers caused Israel damage, but not too much, since Jerusalem was quick to take responsibility and to apologize. The addendum here was, it is assumed that Israel will have to pay compensation to their families. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Actually, a very telling and moving song, which is extremely touching with a spectacular story. The song is dedicated to Yehuda Bacher. It's called Elohe Neshama. It's sung by two brothers, along with Avishai, a famous Israeli singer. Yehuda was murdered at the Nova Festival on October 7th by Hamas. He had recorded his version of this song just days before he was murdered. His voice and image are spliced into the recording. The song is based on a thousand-year-old prayer written in France, and it's based on the line from the Talmud in the Tractate of Brachot. On page 69, the top side of the back side of the folio page, actually four lines down, it's recited in the morning upon waking up. The prayer thanks God for returning our souls to us and requests that when the time comes that you, God, escort my soul into the world to come. It is very, very powerful. Let's watch the video. Neshama shenatata bi Tehorai Eloah 
נשמה שנתת בי. טהורה היא. אתה בראתה, יצרת, אתה נפחת בי. ואתה משמרה בקרבי, ואתה עתיד נתלה ממני, ולחזיר הבלעתיד לבוא. כל זמן שהנשמה בקרבי, מודה אני לפניך. כל זמן שהנשמה בקרבי, מודה אני לפניך. שבטוח שטוב לך שמה, אחרת לא היית מוסיף לך איך אלינו ביום ולילה. האהוב שלנו, דש מלמטה, ובזכותך אומרים כל בוקר, אלוהי נשמה בכוונה, ולא נשכח אותך, כי לנו היית במתנה. אדוני! May the soul of Yehuda and the souls of all those massacred on October 7th be bound in eternal life. May their souls be a blessing. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. Thank mm-hmm. you.